Okay, so we start. So thanks a lot for being here, and so I'm really happy to introduce now uh, the third uh, event of the Disruption Network Club. And uh, for the people that uh, still don't know what we do and who we are, um, we are a team actually of uh, three women and other great helpers that are coming, uh, uh, working with us for every event. And so we are. I am Tatiana Bazzichelli, the artistic director, then Daniela Silvestrin, the project manager and curator, and also Kim Foss uh, that works uh, with us on the production. And uh, we are uh, an ongoing platform of events and research that is based on art, activism and disruption. And our main uh, funds are the Abstadt Kultur Fund Berlin and the main cooperator is the Kunst and Kreuzberg Betanien. And uh, for these uh, specific events of uh, today and tomorrow, we are also having a special collaboration uh, with the Spectrum, that is an uh, independent space that just opened in Berlin last uh, June. And then we have uh, another great collaboration with uh, Topics, uh, that uh, uh, is a bookshop uh, in Neukölln, and uh, they have uh, a wonderful table over there, and uh, I hope also that you are going there to have a look to see what they do. And uh, so now let's go into the topic of this event, a game of view into the social media vortex. And uh, first of all, I have to say that for these uh, events, I want uh, to deeply thank uh, Gabriel Moses, uh, because we have been doing that together. So actually, I think you will have time to you know, applaud him later, but I really feel with my heart to make an applause to you now, because it has been a great collaboration among us, so please, uh, uh, I think we have to thank Gabriel also for his effort in contributing to this event. Please applaud. <laughs> yeah. And uh, starting uh, going a bit inside the topics, uh, as I say, the topic is a game of view into the social media vortex. And a game of view is a title uh, that is coming from the comic collection series The Sandman, that is actually is also uh, sold for sale at the topics uh, book stand there. And uh, we decided that was a great uh, way to uh, define these events because, uh, uh, I mean, this is a specific comics uh, series that uh, uh, was published in the 90s, especially A Game of View comes from 1993. And it's also a female story, and it's an entire female story. And we thought it was also important uh, to address this aspect uh, by connecting to this specific uh, uh, collection. And so, as we usually do at the Disruption Network Club, we are bringing together different expertise. Uh, so we have artists, uh, graphic novelists, uh, developers, and researchers. And so, so why we decided to call it a game of view into the social media vortex? The idea was um, from one side to question uh, the discourse of social media and to try to connect it uh, to the form of storytelling. And this has been the special contribute of Gabriel that we'll also bring uh, uh, soon in a few minutes to you. And uh, the idea would be how, what uh, happens, for example, if we uh, connect uh, the storytelling with our Facebook timeline. And also uh, the idea of uh, this social media vortex could be um, what happens if uh, somehow we lost our identity uh, into the imaginary of social media, like a sort of psychedelic uh, imaginary. So this has a kind of positive take. But then, uh, not that we have a negative take, but still we want to be also critical, as we usually do at the Disruption Lab. And so the question would be, um, for example, if we uh, lose our identity into the social media vortex, uh, uh, what could happen? And uh, uh, then we are raising questions related to form of sexism and also online hate uh, and the need of advocacy for against uh, uh, online harassment. And uh, this is also pretty connected with the discourse of the Gamergate and uh, um, then uh, 
also will be somehow connected with the techno Viking if we speak more on the discourse of losing our identity into the virality of social media uh, by also reflecting on the discourse of intellectual property. And uh, unfortunately, I have to say that Zoe Queen cannot be with us today. She was initially announced, but she, she cancelled some days ago, but we are really glad to have a wonderful person joining us, that is Chris Cover, and she will be part of the panel after the keynote of Gabriel. Um, and I also want to introduce her briefly for the people that uh, uh, maybe were expecting Zoe Queen. We are really happy to have Chris, and she's the co-founder of Missy Magazine, also a journalist and feminist activist. And so, um, with her presence, uh, we will not, not only speak about the discourse of Gamergate and debate on sexism, but also, for example, um, have a more local dimension uh, with the Aufschrei tag that I think uh, probably many of you know, and uh, also other topics that she will address that now I'm not, not going to present in detail while we have a great moderator later, Oliver Lerone Schutz. This is always the work. <laughs> and uh, after that, uh, uh, we will bring uh, all of this into a performative uh, dimension with uh, Pedro Lopez. Um, and uh, he will be both with the other speakers, uh, Matthias Fritsch, uh, Chris Cover, um, uh, to uh, participate in the panel, but also will be the one with other musicians creating. Uh, a conference, uh, sorry, a concert at Spectrum later. And uh, this uh, concert will start at, at past nine, so I really ask you please to be punctual because we really have to start a sharp in time since we have problem of noise, as usually is happening in Berlin in these times. And uh, he will disrupt the social media vortex by interfacing the musician muscle with the audience. And uh, so, now, after this brief introduction, I want to introduce Gabriel, so please come here on stage. And uh, actually, we have been already working together for some time with uh, um, Gabriel, also when I was curating at Transmediale, he was speaking there. Um, and uh, the genesis of this event uh, is that one year ago he came to me and we started already to discuss how we could turn all these great imaginary ideas into an event. And we still didn't know that we were going to get these funds. Then uh, the good things happen and so <laughs> we could do this program. So then we put into practice uh, all this idea. And uh, so for the people that don't know Gabriel, um, he's a sequential artist, a published graphic, graphic novelist, uh, and a commentator on visual literacy in media. And also he defines himself in a funny way that uh, I don't know what this means, maybe you can say. He's into very serious comics for very serious people. So perhaps through your presentation we will understand what this means. And uh, as I say, he was already speaking in many conferences like Trasmediale here in Berlin, the File Festival in Sao Paulo. And one of his recent projects, the Announcement, won the first prize um, at the Anthropocene Project Conference at the Haus der Kultur and der Welt in Berlin. So now I'm really happy to uh, welcome you, Gabriel, and thanks again for this great collaboration. And I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Well, well, first of all, um, let me get a free Chelsea Manning. Yeah. That's always a good way to start, right? So um, this evening, I'm supposedly going to be the cisgender dude talking about comics and computer games in this annoying American accent, uh, which is weird because I definitely don't identify as cisgender. I'm not exactly going to talk about comics. I don't know the first thing about computer games, and I'm definitely not American, according to my passport. 
But that's also a really good place to start this event because we are definitely going to be talking about this blurring of the lines and the way in which forms of playful or, if you will, gamified visual storytelling, and comics is one of them, how they are affecting the way in which we engage in identity politics among other forms of polity online. So, so far, off to a good start. Uh, but let me just pause on the whole identity politics thing. So, the perspective of this talk is going to be one of a white, Caucasian, male, Israeli, Jew living in multicultural Berlin in its alternative bastions today. And so, I get a kick out of manipulating various freedoms to my liking. Uh, I'm about as privileged as it gets. If anything, I am trans-privileged. So, I can just take in what I want and put it back. Uh, and that's an enormous freedom, and I think some of you here uh, could relate to that. Uh, I'm saying this because I will be uh, using terms like we or us or Western in a somewhat unaudited fashion, speaking freely at times. So please consider my we refers to this us here uh, as this heterogeneous representation of social media users of the West with a capital W, which is not any broad geographical Western space, but rather an ideology, maybe. Namely, us is we in this very room. And I'm supposing that we here are all lucky enough to have a smartphone or iPad, let alone substantially uninterrupted daily access to the internet and time on our hands to go and massage our minds in artsy evening talks by pseudo-punkers like myself. So, if I were to pitch the main argument underpinning uh, this keynote, I'd say it will discuss what happens if and when we rethink quote-unquote online life as an interactive comics or actually why this in fact is proving to be a very bad idea unless our approach to this premise changes and uh, reconfigures. So, you know, okay, fuck it. Uh, let's talk in a jargon truly suited of uh, this occasion. So this would be the talk outline. I will start by making an introduction to my personal introduction to the concept of social media story game. And that would be the very chapter of my biography, if you will, where I first became aware of these notions, my controversial superpowers, kinda. Then that revelation sees me going on a quest made of my attempt to engage with this idea of online life as gamified storytelling and the trouble I ran into when doing so. And then the plot will thicken uh, when I meet my academic arch rivals, which would inevitably lead me to the third part, and that would be a defense of sorts of my stance on the matter. Because I would argue that, true, the online as cyber drama concept is a potent but in fact shaky one, but with great powers come great responsibilities. So I would argue that the very problematizing of the concept is exactly what we need to help us underpin the imperative flaw uh, in this, this crisis of interface which we've learned to naturalize. And why, if we don't adhere to it on time, it will bite us in the ass. And this version of my superhero quasi game will conclude with an interactive live video demonstration of how we don't adhere to it on time and it inevitably bites us in the ass. Okay, so let's do this. Here's why the connection to comics seems abundantly clear to me from a relatively early on in the formation of Web 2.0 and what that basically what came after the dot-com crash on the turn of the millennium. Okay, 
So that was MySpace in 2005. So obviously pop punk and emo ran rampant at the time, and this girl's page was all pink and black lines and Scott checkers. But this was also before Facebook took over with its extremely restricted template designed to fit the needs of generic citizens of centric Siberia. Uh, so MySpace, on the other hand, appealed to um, mainly music lovers and offered them semi-hackish toolkits of copy-pasted codes and widgets to create um, pages which looked like mini pop idol campaigns for their virtual alter egos. Um, so the early 2Ks were also this time when the net was still spider webish and decentralized enough, or at least so it was still naively perceived, so that it seemed to offer more online experimentation with a touch of flirty zest. And things still harbored a sense of wondrous unknown, and the online social media realm still seemed more like the never-ending story, and less like the IKEA version of The Matrix. And I remember glaring at the screen and x-raying through the little text bubbles and posted images of girls and boys with excessive eyeliner and making duck faces with their new Nightmare Before Christmas props. But all I could think of was, no way. That's the future of comics right there. Why? Because instead of websites, I saw comic pages. And for me, MySpace was a setup of creative, pictographic templates. It was a mess of colors and shapes, images, icons, and texts. To me, wallpapers like these were a framework of panels which permeated and enriched the main plots in the center of the page, and their aesthetic and content was customized by users instead of authors and illustrators. But to really zero in on my point, here's an example I found the other day which reminded me even more vividly why I became so convinced in this analogy. So... Aside from being one of the creepiest images I found online so far, and I really can't recall at the moment if this is a hoax, uh, an actual sales dummy, or an actual page, what's clear to me is that this page truly does have the components needed to tell a drama. Uh, there's a protagonist posing in various locations with her pet sidekick, and the wallpaper tiles look like a layout of her thoughts and romanticized inner turmoils. Uh, it's titled, Eight Days Till I'm Back in His Arms Again, and she is on my extended network. How creepy is that? I mean, this girl is on fire. She's on a mission, maybe a revenge. I mean, really, if there's a film like The Ring about a videotape that kills, there should be a similar one about a MySpace killer page. Check the IMDb files. There probably was one. And then I thought, well, obviously, someone must already be writing something about this pictographic storytelling phenomenon. If I wasn't so lazy, I'd get to the bottom of it. But... I was a lazy reader, and as it turns out, there wasn't much to read. So instead, I did the next best thing. I made my own book. So it took me three years to finish Spunk. That was my first graphic novel published in Germany. And in it, I figured that it would be interesting to make a bunch of fictitious, illustrated MySpace pages and arrange them chronologically in a kind of uh, timeline, for lack of a better word, so they would tell a story, uh, a crime novel of sorts, about this enigmatic punk rock rebel girl, and readers could follow her entries to try and unravel the mysteries of her death. That is, if she died at all and didn't just log off MySpace in favor of a trendier social network. Now, I really like this project. I feel it might have foreseen a few things, but given it didn't catch on yet, and by that I mean it didn't catch on yet also for me, and I wasn't pleased with the direction it was leading me in because essentially Spunk offered a possible authored translation of digital native culture from web to print. Chris Ware did similar things ages before, and it was far more luring uh, and 
he is still doing it wondrously today. So what about going the other way around? What, what about going print to web? I mean, let's stay with Chris Ware here for a second. He recognized just how reliant social media uh, is on visual grammars using comics. For instance, the pictograms of word balloons in WhatsApp chats, which derive directly from comics. And he incorporated that into his own printed work. But then, why wasn't comics drastically reimagining it itself on the web, online, symbiotically? So, that's where I hit my first wall. The actual webcomics people did not take too kindly to that remark. And they're right. There definitely is some kick-ass webcomics out there, which is very self-reflective and aware of its context. But to me, something in what I would call the PDF-based logic of webcomics remains too confined to print. Like uh, many earlier concepts of websites who too copy printed formats. And on the right here, now there's a page from American Born Chinese, which also won an Eisner Award and was even the first graphic novel to win the National Book Awards. But only after being republished and printed on paper. And then there's the outlet of computer games, especially what we then called quest games. They are considered a direct continuation of comics, exploration, uh, of storytelling. But these to me seemed too immersive, uh, like TV and cinema, to allow serious pause on what I would call phenomenological contemplation. So yeah, maybe it might appear as if I'm hung up on my particular taste in art, especially an artist's taste in art, which is even tougher. Uh, I think nine out of ten highly recommended films suck. I know, I'm always looking for that one exceptional combination. But in principle, I don't think I was actually looking for a new development of the comic art form. What I was missing in hindsight was a new approach to sequential art in general, which would be a lot less static, but not too immersive. If anything, then explicitly meta, and would manifest itself online. So here's what I mean by meta. So back in 1985, a great guy called Will Eisner published a book called Comics and Sequential Art in the attempt to contextualize comics inside the wider scheme of cultural evolution and to also rid it of the implicit comical childish connotations which were attached to the name comics. Then in early 90s, another close follower of Eisner, a guy called Scott McCloud, published a seminal comic essay called Understanding Comics. And there he came up with a more elaborate definition to comics as a form of sequential art, namely juxtaposed pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence. Now, I'm a bad schoolboy, and I haven't read the recent stuff. I only refer to entry-level work, which was long since been heavily contested, but I think it's irrelevant to the point that I'm trying to make. And here's why. Essentially, to both McLeod and Eisner, sequential art and its precedence to comics, we could find them in other media, such as hieroglyphs, reliefs, or illustrated Bible books, etc. So, in my understanding of it, if there is to be retained from this a distinction between sequential art and comics, it would be that comics was established in print technology, whereas sequential art extended to a much wider array of media and technology. So, maybe comics could be considered even a topos, a uh, type of print-based visual literature, whereas sequential art was something else, uh, overarching or in between. I don't know, but definitely more of an approach, a focus, a meta medium. And if I were to equate art with research, I would even suggest in many times it could be used as a tool for generally examining sequentiality in all media. It could do it in the sense that it offers a practice-based study 
and charting of spatial and temporal interplay between various forms of content representation, such as image or sound or motion, within a given media environment. And this certain type of sequential art, especially comics, isn't just pictures with words, but rather a set of picto infographic maps of space and time. So just to give you one example of what I mean, this page here is from Death, the High Cost of Living, which belongs to the Sandman series uh, from which we took the A Game of You title. But th this is not just a story about a guy and a girl in a room, it is in fact a spatial charting of time, namely the time that it takes a cigarette to burn down. How long is that? Someone online timed it at 6 minutes and 23 seconds for a Marlboro cigarette. So based on that, this comics layout is a spatial map in the sense that we can perceive this whole passage of time in one glimpse, and if we were to trace our fingers top to bottom, left to right, we'd be charting the passage of this period of time. So this is a 6 minutes, 23 seconds compressed into one, which again makes this... this story, which is also a picto-infographic map of space and time. So this in-betweenness, this uh, playful visual study of sequence, these pauses for semiological observation, which are not so apparent in media like written literature or cinema or even programmed code, I would say, was something that existed in previous media predating comics. And I say media and not just art because hieroglyphs for instance, were a communication medium. They were a charting of power in history as much as they offered artistic merit. So then I thought, why not implement them on new pictographic media environments like Facebook, for instance. In other words, could I say that with all these WhatsApp and chat word balloons and interconnected images that social media is the evolution of comics. Again, a very meta, very comics-oriented form of communication which uses concepts McLeod came up with in 2000 which never quite materialized for web comics, like the infinite canvas of comic book panels. That was one idea. Well, that's the infinite scrolling down on your Facebook or Tumblr feed, right? or his suggestion of comic panels connected through a zoom in and zoom out um, aesthetic or, 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 or logic, which is what I would, that's what I do when I use this you know, touch device. And social media obviously creates weird phenomena and tensions between protagonists and environments which are charted pictographically. So, Based on my basic acquaintance with comics theory, I devised a number of ideas on how to do these comparisons, and then being the courageous, benevolent neighborhood Spider-Man, which I of course am, I tried to test my newly acquired skills and spin some cobwebs between the rigid IKEA networks of today's centric social media, and I presented my findings to an academic crowd. But my cobwebs mostly ended up getting into everyone's faces, and at the end of the talk, they were like, ugh, 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 no, you, oh, you, you, can't, you can't do that. Uh, uh, I, I, I bombed majorly in that conference. Why? Well, two things come to mind when making these unprecedented analogies. Well, the first, um, and this is where ludic practices and playfulness converge with story, there is the much higher degree of interactivity and control dynamics which online media offers. Comic stories are static, no matter what happens in them, whereas Facebook really does move and swirl and swoosh, and Facebook really does fall into the wrong hands of evil shadow governments who try to spy on you and take over the world using your powers against you, etc. So embedding a static comics page inside Facebook sort of like feels like I'm forcing an advanced computer to reduce its features to a static program which is one million times less potent, then why even go there? Why not just study online communication in its own right? 
And the second thing is that a narration seems to presuppose an intentional narrative path paved by narrators. So who are they? What's the difference between a character and an author on Facebook? I mean, of course, Roland Barth declared the author dead, but isn't this an overstatement? And I actually saying that social interaction is an art form. How about corporate espionage as an art form? That gives the field a positive outlook. So basically, I was first criticized for obfuscating lines instead of defining methodologies of fucking distinctions up, which were sacrosanct to narratologists, like the difference between game and story, narrative and discourse, uh, mimesis and digesis, performing and telling, authoring and engaging. So to many of them, it seemed I was suggesting a route which was eventually counterproductive, made things hard to study, to define, to understand. And here's when it becomes really interesting. Some of them were afraid that I might be unintentionally propelled by a dangerous, implicit agenda. If I am suggesting that life should be seen as a gamified cyber drama, am I also suggesting that life should be controlled by an author or designer or authority and that we should tighten this control? So to counter these rebuttals, let me just remain on an artistic level and remind you here that what would be considered conventional storytelling has too evolved in similar paths on its own. Reality TV is, to my understanding, a very accepted, participatory, voyeuristic, espionage-based art form, let alone for the me generation. So thinking of social media as a, a form of open-end Big Brother platform isn't that wild and outlandish thought. And you can obviously guess the response to that last claim, uh, with which I would also agree. Reality TV, at least the upfront cult around it, sucks ass. I don't want to live my life when every emotion and maneuver of mine turns out to have been vicariously orchestrated by some other directive power looking to make a buck. So if anything, the still very present lack of control, the, the chaos online, is the one good thing which we as users have that allows us to disrupt the network, to subvert its intentions, to still somehow camouflage ourselves under these panopticon gazers, uh, to jam the control systems, to make our own web cobs out of their rigid nets. If I were to borrow Hakim's Bay distinction of web and net online. So why on earth would I be opting to perfect the tool of narrative control? That would be counterproductive. And here is my answer. I'm not. But it's a double-edged dagger. I mean, yes, for those purposes, chaos is great. But is this really a black and white war of liberating chaos versus new world order that we're fighting here? I would say that this picture is hanging downside up, or at least with a mean lean sideways, because most of the chaos I see is used maliciously by big business against private users and not the other way around. Here's what I mean. At first, when we think about centralized hermetic frameworks um, and design like Facebook or online streaming sites, we may assume that finding disruptive bugs, flaws in the design is almost as impossible as finding a typo in a Coca-Cola ad. But the very opposite is true. Okay, please be ruthlessly honest with yourselves for a moment. Please raise your hands if you have a grandpa or a grandma who would know which of these buttons to press if they wanted to watch a video on the iPad that you bought them for the holidays. How many clicks away are they from installing a virus, landing in a porn site, or downloading a torrent by mistake and ending up in financial legal trouble? And what about you, the activist? the advocate for noble causes like fighting climate change, 
galvanizing people to take action against things like animal cruelty, war crimes, uh, Kanye West. How is this chaos serving you when you fire away from your Facebook stations into the world? How much control do you have over your narrative and action? For better or worse, these engines thrive on inconsistencies and chaos. That's how they push product. That's how they retain one-sided control. Take the like button, for instance. Liking seems like a rather decisive function. But its name conceals the fact that not all likes are alike. And many times, liking has nothing to do with liking. Say I have a like-minded, gender-fluid, feminist, lefty, Israeli, vegan friend who's also a fellow slacktivist, and he posts a horrifically graphic, pungent, extreme, right-wing political item which pops up on my feed. And what do I do in response to this abomination? I like it. Because essentially, like has just become a way to mark stuff. It can mean anything from, I love it. I agree. Thank you for sharing this with me. This is extremely important to me. Or simply, I see you. And all the way to, I hate it. And I identify with your hate. Or, I disagree completely with the content, but approve of you raising awareness to it. This is completely silly, fun, and unimportant. Or, I see you because I want you to see me. The word like has been completely stripped down of its original connotation. In many cases, it's practically idle. And that's the tool we use most to try and bring down the state. How about join? Attend buttons. That's how they were called back then on Facebook. This event... Game of You had nearly 600 hits. Good people who made a solemn oath f to us to join, to attend. We have a very nice turn up today, especially with the heat and all. Thank you for coming. But I hope the guys at the Spectrum Bar didn't base their stocks on that count, because if so, then they're sure as shit going to be drinking a lot of leftover beers alone when this night's over. And share... Do you know how much bullshit I've shared at 5 a.m. in the morning, which probably ended up on a friend's feed in South Africa, which whom I never exchanged a word and was probably unseen by anyone who'd be interested before it fell to the bottom of that scroll bar where Facebook posts go to die? Or maybe everyone saw it, and that's what incited that Arab Spring thing in those other countries. I mean, seriously, sometimes I think I really don't have control over my superpowers. But let's talk about a real hero figure. Okay, you tell me. I respect Julian. I really do. He speaks for me, ripped condoms aside, all the way. But don't you ask yourself sometimes just how effective his actions are? I mean, I really want to see him and WikiLeaks as rebels with a cause. And I do. Aside for the times when his impact seems as powerful as Bono from U2, only with a much cooler hair design, what I'm saying is that the extent of our actions using these Game consoles is something we cannot assess. So, short story long, me and these bunch of awesome academics argue and argue and argued and argued and argued until one of them just said that, again, all these last points are great, but don't necessarily have anything to do with narration or game, rather with online communication, and so he'd rather simply study the web as is, without these analogies or just convoluted allegories to comic stories and games to avoid this reality controlling subtext implied by my approach. And that's when I said, no, that's not my point. Because a lot has happened since Spunk and MySpace. And at this point, this is no longer about how I want to see things. This is about how we are being educated to see things by these higher powers. What is Facebook timeline if not you 
as a chronicle. Facebook timeline actually made my narrated version of MySpace in Spunk obsolete. It closed the link. I remember how uncomfortable it felt to buy into Facebook timeline. I felt like I was losing control. Now, they sent us these New Year's video slideshows of their version of our lives, which they also benevolently allow us to edit and repost as our own. It's a fun gamified feature, which is nothing short of an automatic generator of our certified autobiographies copyrighted by Facebook. Life is already a game story online. It's in the code. It's in the blood of any digital native, and there's no going back from that or around it. So just to enforce this point, I'd like to share a memory with you here. So a few months ago, I had this dream. I dreamt Louis C.K., the comedian, died. Actually, I didn't exactly dream he died, more like I dreamt this very image. A Facebook feed where all of a sudden appeared a post saying, Louis C.K. is dead. That was my dream. And in the dream, I don't remember what room I was in. I don't know what device I was using. I have no recollection of my fingers either tapping or clicking. The whole dream was the screen. <laughs> and then happened what usually happens in dreams. I suddenly went to a completely different place. I googled to see if the news is true, and the last thing I remember was being in a strange Wikipedia environment and checking to see if Louis C.K. is a stand-up comedian or was. I don't remember what was written there. Eventually, I just remember it was a very realistic dream. So there's this very serious political rock band I really like, System of a Down, and in one of their very serious songs, they say, you changed the channels and you changed our minds, end quote. So this might be true about older generations or in many circles where people are still stuck in front of their TV for the news round, but for the people here, for me, uh, for the new generation of digital natives, change the template and you change our recollection. Now that's a very 1984 moment right there. And I'm not just talking about the way my stored memorable moments from last year are changed when a social network changes their layout and redefines and resizes and repositions these memories on my screen. My screen is sometimes all I've got to work with now, with friends and contacts and news from other places, geographically distant. And this shit even affects my dreams, people. How about you? So from vigilante to vigilante, don't you think it's time to be a bit more vigilant? Have more vigilantes out there? How many anons are out there at the end of the day? How many users are really alert enough in which sectors and circles and with enough attention to actually check before they click and share away unaudited information. So I'll conclude. I respect and accept the critique. There might not be absolute authors. There might not be, and there might be needed, a new fragmented understanding of authorship in this age where copyright will no longer allow users to preserve control over their culture production over their identities, which could be stolen or manipulated into viral memes by large communities who just click away. Like um, Mr. Techno Viking felt was happening to him. But Matthias Flitsch, responsible for the original Techno Viking meme, quite by chance learned the hard way that copyright laws mean a very different things in the hands of independent creators and in the hands of big companies and reactionaries who use them to infringe and restrict the liberties of creative and independent users even more. Or people like Zoe Quinn or Justine Sacco, who probably 
felt like they're losing control over the narratives of their entire lives, which were suddenly hijacked or trashed in virulent, misogynist online rampages or massive shaming campaigns by a bunch of computer geeks who just wanted to get laid or a bunch of people with Twitter accounts who didn't know any better. Because one thing is certain, authoring in its conventional sense might be a thing of the past, but authority still strongly prevails. And today in these Deleuzean metamorphing societies of hyper control, it is becoming even harder to demarcate their locus and outreach as we gradually are more and more and more sucked into the narratives about us that they extend to us in these information feedback loops, these short circuits where our pictographic biographies are collected algorithmically so that they can study them, redesign them, and plug them with preferred line of products most suitable to our story in a way which would also introduce the proper ideological components to help ourselves keep ourselves at bay. So this sort of brings me to the last artistic part of the evening. Uh, let me just do something here. Okay, good. Okay, I, I won't be presenting this last bit myself. Jordan, or she prefers Jay, she's a very talented young colleague, and I teamed up with her for this project, so she will present it since it's based on her biographical input. Only seems fair. I just poked her, uh, so she knows she's supposed to join us any moment now. Uh, but I will say in the meantime, this is what I'd like to call an augmented graphic novel, so maybe a word on augmentation, on extension of simulation into reality. Uh, I think we're going to see and hear a bit more of this by Pedro Lopez later on today. So there was a moment when I thought what I've just shared with you might not apply to smart devices with micro interfaces because a smart screen looks a lot less comic-y than a big laptop or desktop screen. There's less info, it's very minimal. But the opposite is true. These devices only heighten our crisis of interface. The pictographic interface is now everywhere, all the time. It collapses the symbolic order into the real in a way which leaves us no more access to even try glimpse at the real, to realize that there is something beyond our cocooned pictographic perception. And at least in the West, with a big W, these currently spreading interface simulate life using technology incompatible to it and reducing it to consumer-driven, universalizing appropriations of effect. That, that was something I plagiarized from a text about Michel Houellebecq. Never vote for someone like that, but do read his books. They're very honest. Anyway, at the same time, we're buying into even faster, more encroaching controlling models which naturalize this perception of reality and replaces our sensory faculties with those of a desensitized amalgamation of automated apps controlled by some mainframe extending beyond us. So on Facebook, we enjoy vicarious control of anyone marked in a green dot, a green light. Green means on. That right there with the green light is a character I can use to get info on a party or a romantic tips or on vegan cooking because I'm a good person or deliver him a political message save the world, we activate our friends like characters in old quest games. They're literally like the gnomes in Golden Axe, which you would, you know, you would poke them or kick them to get the gold sacks. Or the keys to the treasure chest we need to open to pass the level in our little narrated quest game of our life. But then we just turn them off, kick the gnome in the butt, who cares, we're busy, we're working here doing some serious play. 
We have even less of an idea which Taiwanese kid jumped off the top story of a factory after piecing together our new smartphone, so we can activate our little bullshit apps mindlessly and send signals unknowingly to even more machines, which suck up more energy, rendering entire plains in Africa and Alaska into drilling mines, which used to be natural reserves. So just keep one thing in mind: on someone else's app, you're that green dot. Which could be turned off and on, reconfigured by pure whim. The reduction to narrated pictographic life has happened. We need to start owning it. Learn to read it. Fuck with the narrative. Change the rules of engagement before it renders us into walking bulletin boards of shallow and indifferent multicultural propaganda, at the servitude of new neoliberal fascist corporatocracies. That was dramatic. But what's it, what is worse is that there is no us and them when you're alone with your smartphone on a train. There's just you and a bunch of overgrown kids who think it's just a story. Or if you're unlucky enough, they all want to play your game. How many lives have you got left? Yeah, so that was that.、Um, I guess we're just gonna have to wait until Jay comes online.、Um, she should be here any moment now.、Uh, in the meantime, thanks for attending. Oh, she's here.、Um, sound. Jay, are you there? Jay. Yep. Okay, go. Okay, hi.、Mm, my name is Jordan, but online I'm Jay. So just Jay. And、um, I'm from the future or tomorrow, like 2000, and you know. So what I'm showing you guys here is an app, and it looks like a weird chromosome thing made out of cells, which are actually sleeping. And it's all basically a story made of lots of itty bitty stories, like particles of text and pictures about me and my friends. So this is us. Or like me and my friends looking hella bored, and we all live in these houses in suburbs somewhere in the world. And there's no wars because everyone is totally okay with things. Everyone understands everybody else. That's because everyone speaks English like only. And all the rest of the poor people in the world are now dead because there's no more ecosystem, I think. Or those guys just don't matter anymore because everything is made with robots. So technology is all wow. Everything is like virtual and 3D and moving, and you can touch it and does 3D stuff, you know, augmented reality stuff. Anyways, you can move through this app, and that way you also learn how we do stuff nowadays, or like how we think, but not actually think, think, because thinking is also boring for us. So we actually don't think, we link. <laughs> In other words, this app is basically a bunch of interconnected info about us, and each time you finish one bit, you choose which next bit to link it to, whichever way you want, and then it becomes all less boring, like a story. Basically, everything we do goes online eventually. Like in this story, we take a cutie kitty cat and we kill it. We tie it to the rails, and then when a train comes, it makes this precious boy little face. So then we take a picture of it and we post it. Uh. Ah. J J, can I interject? Yep. Okay. You're not mentioning the theoretical backbone of the story, you know, the the back what? The backbone, the the life story of Bernard Bujebra. Oh right, right, yeah. You know, the guy who predicts everything. Right, that, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so if you could. So. Okay, thanks. Anyway, so yeah, each cell you activate in this app, you learn more about us, and there's also some heavy philosophy stuff by this depressing dead Algerian French guy. You can read if you're really philosophical. Like here, he's all like. The problem we are still facing is pr 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 primarily that of interface. We like and like everything until everyone and everything is all alike. The liking has nothing to do with it. And blah blah blah. You get it. It sucks. Probably old people will find it fascinating. But like,、um, if you keep playing and connecting to the right stuff, it leads you to loads of cool features, and you eventually discover what we're doing. For instance, the other day I'm totally bored, right? So I fuck my brother, and then I make him kill himself, and then I cut myself in the shower, which was sad, but like in a beautiful way. 
Or another time, I go and gun down all my classmates, and they all act scared and stuff. Or sometimes you can detonate yourself in a crowded bus or department store and be all like, ah, fuck the system. Anyways, you can always go back to the chromosome and it shows you how far along you are in the story. Because your goal is basically to reach the end of each of the main parts, which are these uh, clusters, right? They're basically like levels you need to pass to get to the next one. Like here, I almost made it to the end of the first cluster and now it's getting all radiant and tweaked up. But I'm just gonna fast forward here. So this is a really progressive stage and the entire top is already rotting and cancery. But never mind that now. Because the more you read you find there's even weirder stuff happening. Like in New York there's this water coming from the ground and nobody knows where it's coming from and it's like growing and growing and everybody's getting super worried, even the president. And this scientist guy now finds out that water actually has a rhythm and it's weird because it's exactly the same rhythm me and my friends all dance to. It's sort of this tribal thing. And we're the only ones hearing it. We hear it in our headphones while we share and kill stuff. And we also hear it rising from the ground each time we bend over the toilet to barf last night's dinner. So basically, we're probably the ones causing it. And if you really make it to the very end, you can actually hear it. we're a bit over time so if you could just skip to that next part it wait would... for it okay but it's just wait it... for it Jay what the hell are you doing in there Jay none of your business Jay what mom's calling you for dinner and I really need to go <sighs> give me a minute Anyways, yeah, it's this cool new kind of metal sound. So yeah, we're the new shit in this boring world and we finally come of age and now we're set to destroy it and it's fun too. Turns out when you break it all down, it really breaks down. So um, thanks again for setting this up guys and welcome to this final stage of enhancement. Okay, bye. Bye. Kids. Shy guy.